I'm here today, I want to talk about uh, the foundation, the groundwork for why mental illness should be a top line item for Republicans on uh, a platform. How many of you have a cell phone with you? Anybody have a cell phone with you? Yeah. Of course. Who doesn't? <laughs> you have a cell phone? Take that. Do you have, you have uh, your pops with that? In your pocket? You do? If you have your pops, connect to them. I want you to use it. But if you don't, but I'm going to have a cell phone. I'm going to be serious. I'm going to ask you to pull something up on YouTube. That's what we're doing. This. And if you don't have a cell phone, I don't believe you're in college, or you're a millennial, or something like that. So what I want you to pull up on YouTube, don't start it, and is a video called What It Is Like to Hear Voices. What It Is Like to Hear Voices. And so look it up. Come on, take that look what is left in your voices? It's starting. But what I'm going to want you to do is you're going to pull that up. When I tell you to, you're going to actually play that on your earphones or whatever else. Is that the right one? Is that so? It should have a blue screen that likes it. What is like to your voices? Right, and it should look like this. What is like to your voices? Blue screen. Got that? That's what you should have. You got it. Don't start again. Put pause. It's moving. Okay, ready? <clears throat> and when I tell you to, if you don't have earphones, I want you to put up to your ear and play it at full volume. Okay? Full volume. 100%. So the point is irritating if you listen to it. I don't want you to get it that way. I don't want you to hurt your ears, but I want you to have as high as you can stand it. All right? Now you can either by one ear or both, whatever it is. But we're going to start that. <laughs> And when I tell you to do that, I'm going to want you to listen to that again at full volume. I'm also going to want you to do, perform a task to count back to 100 by sevens. Don't start with that. Okay, you ready? Um, and I'm going to play this too. I'm going to play this too, so it's also going to be over here. Right here. All right? Start, start going. Start going. I just want to tell you that I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Okay, stop. What was that like for you? You can turn it off now. It's stern. Sometimes it's hard to turn off the voices. But what was that like for you? It was annoying. Anything else? Not enjoyable. What was I saying? Were you doing the task too, counting backwards? Yeah. Not a great part. Why not? Couldn't do it? They didn't do well in math in school. All right, what was I saying? And many of you, any idea what I was saying? I have no idea. I said, put the knife down. I have a taser. I have a gun. Put the knife down. Put your hands up. Walk out of the store. That's what I was saying. You didn't hear me, did you? The reason I'm saying that is that's a small dose of, in terms of dealing with severe mental illness like psychosis or schizophrenia, of what people with severe mental illness are dealing with. About 2% of the population is schizophrenia. A little more percent with schizoaffective disorder, bipolar, we're in that age range, we're in that range. And this is really important to understand. This very small percent of people, probably in the violence area, responsible about 10% of homicides, uh, 30 plus percent of mass shootings, 67% um, of people who are homeless, uh, have mental illness, about 8% of those with schizophrenia, others with depression, about 95, 90. 
5% of males have been homeless and depression, and 87% females. So this goes on and on. It's pretty significant. But what I wanted you to experience there for a moment was how severe this can be when the voices are ahead. Now, it's not that way all the time for someone with severe mental illness. It, you know, it waxes and wanes. And if the person is in the midst of a crisis, you did that for less than two minutes. Imagine if that was going on for you hour after hour, day after day. And you had trouble sleeping. You couldn't sleep. The lack of sleep exacerbates a lot of mental illness. And imagine what it's like if these voices are telling you lots of negative things, right? Weren't they, what were they telling you? What were the voices telling you? Calling your names and derogatory comments. And so if you're hearing that and trying to communicate with others in school or family, and that's what are you talking about? There's nothing like that happening. They may think some of these uh, psychotic symptoms, such as disorganized behavior, aggression, moodiness, and paranoia, you must be part of the problem because if I believe these things are happening and you're not, maybe you are part of the FBI, maybe you are part of the CAA, maybe you did plant those geolocators in my teeth that's trying to find you and are trying to get away so I better pull my teeth out. Maybe you're poisoning my food so I shouldn't do that. And all these things are exacerbating the conditions for such folks. And what do we do about it? Well, a little history. Has anyone here uh, heard that who was responsible in California for closing the state hospitals? Anybody hear that? Who was it? Well, they say Ronald well, right, right. So here's, here's what happens. And time after time, you'll see people blame Reagan and the Republic. But here's what really happened. Um, in the mid-1800s, one by the name of Dorothy Dix, said, you know, we can't just have people shackled and straightjacked and beaten and abused and, and uh, sent into homes, et cetera, uh, who were severely mentally ill. So she went around and wanted uh, more relaxed institutions, asylums as they were called, where people could be in, in a more relaxed setting. And that went pretty well for a while, understanding we had no medication for things to treat people. But that built up over time, and more and more people go to those places for a wide range of disabilities, and sometimes you just had a relative you don't like, and you put them in there. Uh, and, and these things grew. Oh, okay. And it grew to massive numbers. And then in World War II, it was around the, in the 1950s, we had over 550,000 hospital deaths. But in World War II, the doctors and nurses were pulled out to fight war. And conscience objectors and other people, four apps, et cetera, would go and, and work these places. And they said, the conditions here are awful. Now you get thousands of people with one psychiatrist, like, you know, psychologist, etc. But this grew a great deal. Well, John F. Kennedy was tuned into this issue because his sister had uh, some severe mental illness. They gave her a lobotomy, and she was completely wiped out and hit her from the family. Ted Kennedy went to visit her, and they became the Kennedys became big advocates for closing down these, or doing something else with these institutions. Uh, when Johnson was spread, and there was a massive majority in the House and Senate of Democrats, um, a plurality of they could have passed in of Democrats, they did something called the IMD exclusion, the Institute for Mental Disease Exclusion, which said you cannot have a hospital with more than 16 beds. So the place had a thousand people was there. They said you can have them, but the federal government's not giving you money for them. So federal money disappeared. And then states like California, which uh, was predominant Democrats in the House and Senate, and uh, Reagan was the governor at the time, um, they were also being pushed for a couple of years. One, we don't have the money to do this. We're supposed to go community mental health. And on the other hand, um, the ACLU was saying, you can't be putting people in these institutions against their will. So it was the perfect storm of all these things taking place. Reagan signed it. It was the Democrat legislators that passed it. And the ACLU pushed against their vote. So what did this mean? So it came down to level that um, over the next few decades, over the next few decades, you ended up with those 550,000 hospital beds dwindling down to 30-some thousand now. And where did the people go? They didn't go to community health centers. Some went to group homes. But the large majority of them ended up homeless, imprisoned, temporarily, permanently. Um, families tried to handle them. And the idea was, well, now that we have medication, we can do something, some people will get better. And indeed, some people came out of hospitals, there was a number of stories, people came out of hospitals, and they did do better because they didn't need that level of care. But there was a generalization made about for everybody. 
And then there's other groups, the disability rights group says you can never have someone in a hospital without their consent, and California led the way with some initial laws, of have someone for 72 hours, and then you can have more if you make your courts, but all this now was being decided by the courts, not doctors. And other rules came up to say, but you know what, we want HIPAA laws in place, so you can't get any information, and you can't give any information. So doctors were now flying blind with this too. So we closed beds, we didn't have enough providers, we weren't putting money into this. State after state follow through. And what state says is, you know, well, the homeless, what are we gonna do with that? We don't know what to do. Uh, we can't force people into treatment anymore. Uh, and so it ended up a hot mess. Now, what this is an important issue here is, what do we do about that? Now, we know a few weeks ago, Congress passed another stopgap, uh, kick the can down the road, prevent the government from folding bill, 1.7 trillion. And the usual fights took place there. And over 70% of that was for defense. But a number of problems still exist. You have, uh, what's the national debt today? 34 trillion, right? And we know that the service on the debt every year is 659 billion. I think that's close to or exceeds the Department of Defense funding. And we take in, so spending overall for fiscal year uh, 23 was 6.13 trillion. Revenue is 4.4 trillion. You don't have to pass math class to understand those numbers don't work out and continue with that trajectory. So people look for places of waste, or they may say, hey, let's cut everybody across the board by 2%, 3%, 5%, but that hardly seems fair because some programs need more funding and some programs only get less. But it takes a lot of work to go through the thousands and thousands of federal programs and see what can happen. Well, when we look at how things are where the money goes, um, and, and as far as federal programs, wasn't Reagan that said the closest thing to eternal life here on earth is government programs, and it's hard to get rid of them. When I was moving my legislation, the Helping Families with Mental Health Crisis Act, we were going toe to toe, nose to nose, fist to fist, punch to punch, with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which was spending their money on a lot of silly things, but not on treatment. They didn't even mention schizophrenia. They spent $24,000 on a painting, people sitting around rocks, which had to do with mental health awareness. They spent tens of thousands of dollars on websites and sing long songs for children to give them some happiness. They spend money on their website telling people how to make a group smoothie to reduce stress, under the idea that stress was the cause of all the problems, and that's false. That's not the issue with severe mental illness. Author Ron Powers, who wrote a great book of the name, Nobody Cares About Crazy People, Got that title from, uh, in Minnesota, there was a staffer who was talking to their county executive boss about a scandal at some local mental health hospital where I think it was a sexual assault or something. And they were worried about this coming up before the, the election. And the staffer said, well, nobody cares about crazy people. And the staffer was right. People don't pay attention to those things. And yet you know in this room that some of you have a direct family member with severe mental illness. Some of you may be on medication or getting counseling help for some level of medicate, uh, some level of illness, depression, anxiety, the most likely. And some of you, probably most of you, know someone who's a tender and died from suicide. So it does touch our lives, but Republicans have been averse to this. So I'm going to say, even if you don't care about crazy people, I want to tell you why this should be a top level issue. But let me talk about this from the financial standpoint, because the numbers are something. So healthcare spending a couple years ago was 4.5 trillion. That's 17% of the GDP. And notice where that stands, that is actually, uh, if you compare total revenue from last year, that's more than the revenue. Yeah. Now, of course, that's private and public money too. But um, the federal government actually doesn't know what it spends on mental illness. When I was moving my bill, I asked the general accounting office, can you tell us how much the federal government spends on mental illness? And all they did was send a letter to every department and cabinet posts said, could you tell us how much you spent? And people wrote back, we don't know. But they found something like 112 programs and they wrote back and said, we think it's about $130 billion. But we don't know, it's all guesses. And we don't know if that money actually goes to treat anybody, it's just what we send out. So, there's another federal problem that occurs too, and that is, the way the rules work, at least on the Republican side, if we propose a bill, we have to have an offset. So if they say we want to spend $10 billion here, you got to take $10 billion away from something else. And when I was putting my bill through, one of the things I wanted was more hospital beds. 
So let's remove this IMD exclusion. And the, and the uh, uh, Congressional Budget Office said, well, that'll cost $60 billion over 10 years. So thinking, you know, I remember back in third grade, show your work, and I said, hey, show me your work. How'd you come up with this number? And they actually met in my office, because I also introduced a bill that says you must show your work. They said, we appreciate it if you don't do that. Just take our word for it. I said, no, no, we're not going with this. Suddenly, they reduced the number down to $12 billion. Okay, over 10 years. It's $1.2 billion a year. I said, well, that's a big chunk. What was it? Well, we assumed that if you got rid of this bed requirement, all states would turn everything over to the federal government. That's a big assumption. And I said, well, what's this other number? This what, one billion seems to me we can offset that. And you'll see we can offset that, but there's no. You can't claim there's going to be an offset from prevention. That's dynamic scoring. So let me tell you what some of these costs are. But I want to tell you first in terms of lives. Suicide. In 2021, the CDC estimated that 12.3 million seriously considered suicide, 1.7 million attempted, and nearly 50,000 died. Between 2000 and 2024, that's 950,000 deaths from suicide. These rates go up every year. And by the way, the Veterans Administration um, falsified their data and they continue to do that. You may have heard that number, 22 veterans a day died from suicide. Uh, the, the 2019 numbers that suddenly dropped to 17 a day. How do they do that? They said, you know what? We're only going to count military who can use the VA system. And that means if you're National Guard and Reserve and you've never been deployed or you haven't served at least 90 consecutive days without interruption by uh, drill weekend, <clears throat> You can, uh, if, you, if you don't meet the category, you can't use a VA. So what they said is, we're not going to count National Guard and Reserve, which is a problem because the National Guard has the highest suicide rate. So suddenly went from 22 to 17. And the VA says, you need to give us more money because we found out people who use the VA have less suicide than those who don't use the VA. But they weren't counting the other ones who weren't allowed to use the VA. And I think it's up by one person a day, is all it is. But suicide, that's a big cost of lives. 90% uh, of suicides are associated with some mental health condition, although only half may have had a diagnosis, a recorded diagnosis at the time of their death. Drug overdose deaths. Between 1999 and 2023, there were 864,900 drug overdose deaths in the USA. But at the current rates, that's going to be exceed 1 million people by 2026. There's also a shorter lifespan among the mentally ill. Uh, severely mentally ill, especially schizophrenia, have a higher prevalence of chronic physical illness. Seventy-five percent have at least one illness. Fifty percent have two or more. And those chronic illnesses, short lifespan, and other medical complications and costs. But uh, there's also uh, premature deaths, but the exact count is not known. On the flip side, people with heart disease, like diabetes and cancer, etc., have a higher incidence of depression and anxiety, which exacerbates that illness. Um, I was also told that Medicare, when we try and score these things, Medicare says. If you're talking about doing something that prolongs someone's life, that's a cost. Because death is a cost savings. Death is a cost savings, you say. But that's not true. Because any of you who have had a close family member die know that that affects you for quite a while. It certainly affects the number of things about your work. Um, deaths among the, uh, um, of the homeless, um, and I said it before, 67% of the homeless and we have some mental illness, 18% to 8% schizophrenia. And they have a number of other chronic health issues. Uh, they're 16 times more likely to die early uh, than homeless. Can you say those numbers? Sure, for the homeless. 67 percent have some mental illness. This is a study that just came out yesterday, brand new, in Castilla. Um And uh, of men versus women uh, with depressions, uh, excuse me, it's a um, 95% of men and 86% women have depression. 78% have schizophrenia, 19% overall depression, bipolar is about 8% as well. There's also substance use disorders of 44% among those groups. It's, it's pretty substantial. These are not just people who many times the government says, give them a food card, give them a tent, give them a blanket, they'll be fine. But that's not the case because of people who are struggling. We make things the hardest for those who have the hardest time getting things done. Homicides. 10% of the homicides and 33% of mass murders are committed by someone with schizophrenia. Now I'm going to say it's very important. Untreated schizophrenia. Those who have treated, and about half of those with schizophrenia may be treated, the other half know. About 40% of people with schizophrenia do not even know they're sick. So there's voices you heard. Many people with schizophrenia do not even recognize there's something wrong with them because of what happens emotionally and cognitively. 
So those, but those still numbers are very important. We're talking about two percent of the population is involved with this many homicides. But we don't know what the total is. I have searched and searched and searched. You know why? Nobody keeps the data. Deaths in, uh, in prisons and in jails. Um, they think that about twenty percent of those deaths in prison are listed as a homicide, but no one has collected data on how many of these are related to mental illness. So the total deaths. There's obviously overlap among these groups, and I haven't listed them all. It's difficult to estimate them, but um, tragically, neither the federal, nor state, nor county, or, or the other groups collect data. Look what happened in Oregon when they said, you know what? Instead of putting people in jail with substance abuse disorders, we'll just stop calling it a crime. And they had to reverse it because the substance use disorder went, went through the roof. But California takes that money in the general fund, and they'll send some of the communities and said, well, uh, let's, uh, let's hope that something improves here. Uh, but actually, there was no, no move at all to do anything with substance abuse disorders. So of the hundreds of millions of dollars that come through, nothing goes there. And why is that important? Because of uh, young adults. Um, I'd say uh, the, the rate increase for someone who uh, has psychosis or schizophrenia from using cannabis on a regular basis, one time a week, the, the rate goes up 200 to 400%. 200-400%. We know that 50% uh, of all cases of psychosis could have been avoided for people who smoke cannabis if they did not smoke or ingestible. Um, we know that uh, some of the other numbers reached 21 to 30. That number is 30% higher than what occurred normally. So I say to Pennsylvania, they're about to look at uh, legalizing recreational marijuana, and I'm begging the legislator. Look, the governor's threatening, if you don't do this, I'm just going to simply decriminalize it. And I'm saying, yeah, that's fine, but you're going to end up with Canada saw an over 400% increase in auto accidents, massive increase in the emergency room business, massive increase in ICU stays, longer hospital stays, people using cannabis or cannabis and alcohol. And the increase in psychosis is you know, about $96,000 per year per person. Look at those numbers. The problems that created, no one's taken care of. So what do we do? We end up continuing to put people on the streets and saying, well, they want to be there. Because uh, who wants to go in, into a hospital? It's, the hospitals don't exist. There's no places for people. And there's not enough providers. And these problems start to occur when someone's an adolescent or young adult. Um, and the list goes on and on. I'm giving this thumbnail sketch saying we need to do something. The public by polling says uh, 70 to 80% of people are in favor of doing more with mental health uh, treatment. And these are huge numbers among suburban moms. And why is that important? Because of states like Michigan and Pennsylvania and other pivotal states, the election will be determined in the suburbs. And it will be determined to a large extent because of how suburban women vote. Um, I wish I could get this message to more members of Congress and say, you know what, Look, I get the border issue, I get that, I get the national debt. When you start talking about the national debt that I spend, but if you say to them, do you have a family member or know someone with a mental illness? How hard is it for them to go? Would you like to see them get help? Now you have them in their own reality and in a partial way of living. And if we can take this and understand that this is an issue that is a destroyed and made much harder by liberals who say we should never force anybody to treat, never call them, never make this happen. These are the problems that occur. But we want to look at this and say these are the problems we can solve by having more providers. By with regard to HIPAA laws, that's such things what I call compassionate communication. Allow doctors to reach out to family members when they know that person and say, Your son, your daughter is here at a suicide attempt or something else. I need to talk to you about that. Or I need to get some more history or background. Or to get more of these hospital beds, uh, to stop the idea that some kids we say, Look, I'm not going to kill anybody, let me out of here. Because, you know, medication makes a difference in, in what they do with their lives. To, uh, to boost the number of psychiatrists and psychologists who are out there to do things. There's more we can do. But until we do that, what we're going to see is more crimes continue on with more people homeless and treat them in the most degrading way. Um, in Philadelphia, there's an area um, they just give out needles, doctors will, will inject um, heroin into their necks, et cetera, for those things. But we don't want that anymore. We need to take a stand and we need to work on these issues. This is our area. And we have to take control and reach out to people and say, we're going to make a big difference here. You're going to hear some stories today which are going to emphasize this, but that's where we are. Thank you.